All right, so we are on air. Yes. <laughs> it's my, yeah, so it's my great pleasure to introduce our uh, next speaker for the Sierra Applied Math Seminar Series. Today we have a very distinguished speaker, Professor Gita Kudinok. She is currently, she currently has the Bavarian AI Chair for Mathematical Foundations of Artificial Intelligence at LMU Munich. And uh, she received a long list of prestigious uh, recognitions and awards. I uh, will list only a, a bunch of them. And uh, so, for example, she's a member of Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and Humanities since 2016. She was uh, uh, nominated as a Simon Fellow in 2019. She was the plenary speaker at the European Congress of Mathematics uh, this year, and she will be, she was invited to give a lecture at the International Congress of Mathematics in 2022. So Professor Kutinyok is very well known for her research in applied harmonic analysis, image processing, compare sensing, and more recently uh, on very groundbreaking results on the mathematics of deep learning. So we're really excited to have her in our series and take it away. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much for the very nice introduction. And uh, I would also like to thank uh, all organizers very much for inviting me. It's certainly a great pleasure and honor for me to give a talk here. So let me start by sharing my screen. Yeah, I think we all know how tremendously successful deep learning is these days, but we also know at the same time that there are still major obstacles to be overcome. And uh, mathematics is the way to actually do that. And so in my talk, I would like to introduce you to the area of deep learning, what challenges there are for mathematics, and also show you some of the new results which have been obtained. Yeah, as I said, I mean, deep learning is already all around us. I mean, everybody knows about self-driving cars, uh, telecommunication, speech recognition, sometimes also already legal issues, job applications are sometimes already pre-screened using these type of algorithms. And then certainly also the whole healthcare sector, which, I mean, as we know, unfortunately these days became even more important than it already is. So there, I mean, for imaging modalities, but also reaching critical decisions. If we get a bit closer to sciences, I mean, we also see spectacular successes. I mean, just at the end of last year, there was this article about uh, DeepMind's new AI algorithm, which they called AlphaFold 2. And as this article says, I mean, it, there was, it could be considered a breakthrough in analyzing protein structures. And <coughs> you see this here also in this graphics, uh, that first things were stagnating. And then, I mean, there was a huge leap since these new type of algorithms uh, were introduced. Then getting even a bit closer now also to mathematics or into mathematics, we observe that in the area of inverse problems imaging sciences, since about 2012, these type of approaches also have a tremendous impact. Uh, I mean, in, in basically all different types of problems, sorry, <laughs> think of denoising, edge detection, in painting, and so on. Why? Well, I mean, because there's no rigorous model for what an image is. So that makes it very accessible by these learning type of methods. Now there's a second mathematical problem setting where one could also think about using uh, learning and deep learning type approaches, which is numerical analysis of partial differential equations. But there, I mean, it's not that obvious why this should be used because, I mean, a PDE is a physical model. There's nothing to learn. But what turned out is that in the high dimensional regime, these methods are very effective. And so what you see is since 2017, also their research accelerates to bring these new methods now into this field. So this looks all very bright. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, there are also people who Kind of warned that right now, I mean, machine learning is, um, as it was stated in one of the plenary talks at one of the big AI conferences, machine learning and deep learning is some sort of form of alchemy right now. Uh, so we are not as far as that we get a, have a deep theoretical understanding. And this also causes certain problems. Uh, think of trustworthiness. 
as it says here, computers can be made to see a sea turtle as a gun. Now, so you can easily fool these type of algorithms. And some of you might have already seen pictures of this type where self-driving cars can be easily fooled by putting stickers on traffic signs. And then they make a very different, suddenly a very different decision. And I mean, I think in general, this, this problem um, was already stated in a, which I can really recommend a very nice article in Time News uh, by Mickey Elat, where he wrote about deep learning's impact on image processing, mathematics, and humanity. And at that time, he wrote that there are these new methods where we don't have any theoretical foundation, which we don't understand in that sense. So, um, but which have usually, um, which are usually very effective, often easily reach the state of the art, but also have trustworthy problems. So there's a great demand to drive mathematics further. And from my perspective, there are two main challenges for mathematics in this area. One is mathematics for deep learning. So this targets to drive, derive a deep understanding of deep learning. For instance, asking questions like, how can we make deep learning more robust? What is the impact of depth? And on the other hand, one might call the other direction deep learning for mathematics. So this asks questions like, how can you use deep learning type approaches to solve mathematical problems like inverse problems in imaging sciences or partial differential equations. And so in this talk, I would like to delve a bit deeper in both of those directions and sh show you some uh, advances which have been made. But since I presume that everybody knows everything about neural networks, I will also give, a, give an introduction into what, what they are and also where they arise from, actually because that also helps a bit understanding why neural networks are set up as they are. I mean, everything started with basically McCulloch and Pitts in 1943. Their goal was to introduce artificial intelligence. And uh, they wanted to approach this by introducing an approach, an algorithmic approach to learning. And they used a very natural idea. What they wanted to do is they wanted to mimic the functionality of the human brain. Now, from biology, all of us know how a human brain is structured. You have different neurons which are connected. So the key idea is to mimic a neuron and uh, find a model for, for it. So how does a neuron operate? Well, I mean, you get some signals in here. These are x1, x2, x3, let's say. Maybe these signals are amplified by the dendrites which is where they travel along. This is mimicked and uh, modeled here by these weights. <clears throat> so what arrives is then xi times wi. And everything is collected here in the soma. So everything is summed up here, which is the sum over xi wi. And now the neuron has to decide whether to fire or not. And this decision can, for instance, be reached here or is modeled here in this way that there is a bias B. And if the sum is greater than the bias, it fires. So you get an outcome one. If it is not, you get the outcome zero. Yeah, so there's a very, very crude model of a natural neuron. And then, I mean, we, what we will do is we will connect these neurons and build a neural network. And the three parameters then are the weights and the biases. So this is what we will train later on, uh, on on given data. So now this is a mathematical definition of an artificial neuron. You have weights w1 to wn, bias, you have an activation function, which is univariate. And then an artificial neuron is defined in this way. Uh, so it's defined on Rn. And this is the formula, so it's rho applied to the inner product of x plus w minus b. And you see the similarity to what we saw on the previous slide. There, the activation function was the heavy side function. Yeah? So you had either fire or not. So in that case, the heavy side function was chosen. But I mean, you can imagine you have a whole zoo of different activation functions which you can select. So for instance, if you like something smooth, you can take the sigmoid function. 
Um, what is typically used is the so-called ReLU, the rectifiable un linear unit, which is just the max of zero or x. It's a piecewise linear function, but it turns out that this function is makes the network easy to train, but still it has superior performance. Yeah, so this is usually used in all applications these days. Now we need to connect those neurons. And we will get then compositions of affine linear maps and activation functions. And let me make you show you just, just one, one example. Yeah, so here you see now a neuron, all these yellow dots are artificial neurons. You see something incoming and then one outgoing, outgoing dendrite. And also here, something incoming, outgoing, something incoming, outgoing. Now, how do you write this in, a, in mathematical terms? Uh, this is what you see here. Uh, so you have here x, x1, x2, x3. You multiply this matrix. Um, you multiply this matrix to x, and you see, I mean, this now exactly mimics these connections. The first output is this weight times x1 plus this weight times x2. These are these two connections. Now the second output is this weight times x3, which is this, and then similarly also in this case. In here, now you apply the different components of the bias vector and also the activation function component bias. And then you keep going. Now, this part is again um, modeled by this matrix here. It goes to R2. You again apply the bias vector and so on. Uh, and what you also now immediately see is that if you aim for sparse connectivity, so very few connections, you need sparse matrices. Uh, so there's a direct connection. Now from this, I think it's very easy to write down what a complete neural network is. So now you just extend this part. And um, so an entire neural network is now a function from RD to some RNL, where NL is typically chosen to be equal to one. And again, you see it's a concatenation of affine linear maps. Uh, so here I use the abbreviation variation TL, and here you have the weight matrices and the bias vectors, f linear maps, and then an activation function, and so on. Of particular interest is certainly, I mean, the dimension of the input layer, uh, the number of layers, capital L, which coincides with the number of f linear maps, and the activation function. Hmm. Okay, so that's what a neural network is. Um, and let's now take a look at what the key theoretical questions are. For that, um, I would like to very briefly review with you how we can actually apply such a neural network. Um, so what, what, what's the task typically? I mean, usually a neural network is used to approximate certain functions, which you don't know, from which you just know sample values. So let's imagine the classical scenario, you have a classification function, um, maybe defined on a lower dimensional manifold, which is the case in imaging sciences. And what you just have at hand are sample values. Uh, and so computer scientists like to separate cats from dogs. So imagine you have your manifold here. One area you have images of cats, the other area is images of dogs. And those are maybe mapped to the value one and those to the value two. So you have a lot of images of cats and dogs with the labels associated. These are your samples. Then you split this into a training and a test data set. The training used for training and the test. Well, I mean, you don't show the neural network. You just use it in the end to check the performance. The next step is to select an architecture of a neural network. So you need to select how many layers to take, how many neurons in each layer, which activation function, Maybe you don't want to have a fully connected network, so you pre-select certain entries of these matrices to be set to zero already at this point. Um, and once you've selected the neural network, you need to train it. And we already discussed before, what you now train are the weights and the biases. Uh, so you train and learn these f linear functions. So the entries of all weight matrices and the entries of all bias vectors. And you do that by solving an optimization problem. So let's, let's take a closer look at what, what you actually do. This is my neural network function. And what I want is 
Yeah, so with my neural network function, I want to approximate f. So what I want is now that the neural network evaluated in these xi's is close to f of xi, which I know. The closeness I de measure by the loss function. So this would be the square loss. So the difference squared, for instance. Then I might want to incorporate additional properties of my weight matrix and the bias vectors. Maybe I even want to force them to be sparse. So this I can do here by using the regularization term. So maybe I place the L1 norm on to promote sparsity. I solve this optimization problem by typically stochastic gradient descent. Um, gradient descent itself would not be feasible because usually you have millions of such training samples and you don't want to compute a million gradients. So what you do instead is you select randomly certain of those samples, compute the gradient only for that, and then take basically use this as an average for all gradients. Once you've done that, you get your network. And then what you hope is that this is close to your initial F and this you test now using your test data. Yeah, so this is the, the pipeline, how you use a neural network. And um, why is it so surprising that this works that amazingly well these days? Well, I mean, there are two things which changed since, 14, uh, since 1943. The first is that we have much more computing power these days, so you can train deep neural networks. And that seems to make a huge difference. Now you can train networks with hundreds of layers. And also, since we are in the age of data, we have huge amounts of training data available, which was also not there in 1943. Still, I mean, with these two advantages, it's still a mystery why things work. Because if you look a bit closer, I mean, there are some surprising phenomena which, which are happening and which we will also then see in the, in the list of um, key research directions. One surprising phenomena, um, which people also don't understand these days, um, is why neural networks don't overfit. You have something which has a huge amount of parameters, but still it does not overfit. So what, what is this overfitting phenomenon? So let's assume you would like to separate and classify the green dots from the blue stops. If your classifier <clears throat> is not expressive enough, so it doesn't have enough parameters, maybe you just get a classification like this, which is really bad. Then if you have a bit more parameters, you might get a classification like this, which seems very reasonable since this might be just an outlier. But if you have too many parameters and too many freedom, what could happen is that the classifier aims to enclose these points too closely and so doesn't take care, for instance, of outliers. So if you then have a new sample, which you want to classify, it, it lands in a, in a wrong area. Ah, so that's, that's the phenomena of overfitting. And this you can see also here. So what, what you see here is this comes from statistical learning theories. So therefore, the words are maybe a bit different than what, what I say. Um, but the capacity of the hypothesis class would correspond here to the number of parameters of my neural network. And this is the error, the test error, uh, the, the error in general. So. Ah, and so now you can imagine if I increase the size of my neural network and I train and train and train, then I mean, certainly the training error will go down, go down because I have more parameters and I can fit the data better and better. But here you see the phenomena of overfitting. First, the test error. So once you've trained it, what comes out goes down and then it goes up because then this overfitting phenomena happens. But now with neural networks, the scenario is like this. You still have this regime, but then at some point, when it gets to the highly overparameterized regime, it goes down again. And so this is still unclear why that happens. The training process itself is also a mystery why it works. Because you see, I mean, here you see gradient descent. So if, if it works, it goes in the direction of the gradient and it hits this local minimum. 
With stochastic range descent, I mean, the pass is much more erratic because of this randomness. And so, okay, so here it lands in, in, the, in the global minimum. But it, it seems to be, I mean, not a really straightforward pass. It seems to happen just by accident to some extent. Yeah? And then if you imagine that the energy landscape also now looks like this, I mean, it seems like a really mystery why good local minima are found. So let's come to the key research directions in mathematics for deep learning. I mean, the first is what people call expressivity. Can, can, can I have a question? Can I ask a quick sure. question? Please. Yeah. Could you go back to the previous slide where you have this over parameter? Yeah. So uh, in, in this graph below where you have two plots, these are the, the risk you mean? It's like the theoretical? one or like the one that is obtained by a certain algorithm because if you have more parameters then that you know you should theoretically you know fit better right but so this overfit uh, this double well is it corresponding to like theoretical estimates or just you know practical algorithms uh, so, so, so this is by by algorithm so typically by stochastic gradient descent and this is what you observe it would be okay. a dream to actually have a theory which would explain why this why this happens, but this is still uh, lacking. There are some interesting approaches, but I mean the complete picture is still on the theoretical side, not understood. Okay. Okay. So the first area is expressivity. So this asks the question: um, how to set up a good network architecture, or as I say here, which aspects of the network architecture have what type of impact on the performance later on. So this requires data monitor analysis, approximation theory, um, areas of that type. And this is maybe the most explored area uh, already at this point. The second is learning. So then you train your neural network and you wonder why stochastic gradient descent behaves that well. So why does it give good, why does it converge to good local minima? I mean, the problem is highly non-convex. Yeah? So that's, that's the mystery. And there are also a lot of interesting approaches now, even using areas like algebraic differential geometry, optimal control, optimization. Then what people call generalization. So this is basically the out of sample error. So the question there is, why do neural networks not overfit? What is the role of depth? Why does it work much better uh, since you can train deep neural networks? And you see also there, I mean, here typically um, methods from learning theory, statistics, probability theory come into play. Now, if you view a deep learning problem as a statistical learning problem, then um, you see the error of a statistical learning problem has three components, the approximation error, from the hypothesis class, the error from the algorithm, and the out of sample error. And this corresponds exactly to those three research directions. But then there are also other directions, which I find personally also very exciting, in particular explainability. Explainability takes a bit different path, um, and it assumes you have already a trained neural network, maybe your colleague gave it to you. And now you would like to understand it. You would like to understand in particular how it reaches decisions. Or you have an algorithm and you need to explain the customer why, an why a decision was reached. Uh, and so this requires, for instance, tools for information theory, uncertainty, quantification. Now, I mean, I, I will not focus on this later on, but since I find that there is a mathematical foundation missing, there's barely any mathematics right now in the area. Let me just use one slide to explain to you a bit what, what this is about. Now, so if you have a classifier for digits, let's say your neural network outputs correctly, that this is a three. Then you want to know which pixels are most relevant for that decision. And so these type of algorithms um, would then say maybe the network place a lot of emphasis on those points here because there is a gap which seems to indicate that this is a three, also maybe this curve here, but these parts play against it being three. And let's assume the neural network classified this as an eight, then obviously the, the open gaps 
spoke against this being an aid. Uh, so these are relevance maps, or one can also say heat maps, which indicates for each pixel how important that was for the network's decision. But in general, I mean, what you would like is certainly, I mean, as a mathematician to know what is actually this relevance map? What does it mean in a mathematical sense? And what is an optimal relevance map? And also maybe to use it for challenging modalities. I mean, we, we have some work in this direction where we use information theory. Um, but still, I think a mathematical explanation and the foundation is, is still, I mean, large parts missing. And I think the ultimate vision in this area is to, in the end, get an explanation which is indistinguishable from a human being. And obviously, I mean, this area is highly interdisciplinary and also requires then uh, to introduce novel mathematical tools. So these are the four maybe main directions concerning mathematics of deep learning with a lot of interconnections like robustness aspects, um, something of that type. Then deep learning for mathematics. Uh, so there's first the area of inverse problems um, asking, for instance, how can you optimally combine deep learning with model-based approaches? And also, maybe in the end, we can replace our classical algorithms completely by new networks. But at this point, it seems, and I will also show you examples, the best to combine both worlds. Uh, and also here, I mean, certainly areas of this type um, play a significant role to attack those problems. And then the area of partial differential equations, um, asking in particular why the high dimension regime, why neural networks perform that well in the high dimension regime. Now, if you look at those, those problems, um, the neural network usually plays the role as an approximator. And um, you can then ask the question, are neural networks at least as good as all previous mathematical methods. And then secondly, maybe they are even better. So this is the first question we need to ask ourselves. And this is a question which goes in the direction of expressivity. So asking, are neural networks as good as the previous approximation methods which we had? And for that, and analyzing this, uh, I would like to first briefly review classical approximation theory, and we will then see that neural networks are indeed as good as those tools which we had at hand before. So what, are, what is the goal of classical approximation theory? You have your favorite class of functions, let's say in L2 or D. You have a representation system, and now you want to know how good this representation is, system is for approximating functions from C. The way you do that is, you assume you have a budget N and you're allowed to build linear combinations of these. And then for a given F from your class, you seek to approximate F with a linear combination of the elements of your representation system. Huh? So the error of best N term approximation is the following. You have an F from your class, you have you can take n elements of your representation system and build a linear combination to best approximate. So this would be a best n-term approximation. And then the error which you make is the error of best n-term approximation. Now, if you increase your budget and you can take more and more elements, and this is a complete system, your error will go to zero. And then the question is at which rate does it go to zero? So key is this gamma here. And certainly the larger it is, the better. What you do here is to set into relation the approximation accuracy on one hand, and on the other hand, the complexity of the approximating system in terms of sparsity, because what you aim for here are sparse expansions. Now, so you aim for very few terms, ideally. Okay, so let me fill this with life now with one example for class and the representation system, which we will then also use later on. So the class uh, I would like to introduce are so-called cartoon-like functions. They come from imaging sciences because images are typically governed by edge-like structures. And so these functions look like this. They are compactly supported on the unit square. They are C2, a 
apart from a C2 discontinuity curve. And the definition you, you can see here. Uh, so you have one part which is outside, which is F0, and inside you have F0 plus F1, and both are C2. Now, so this is a model for functions which are governed by an anisotropic structure. And for this class, it was shown also by, by, by Dr. Omaha um, that the optimal approximation rate is n to the minus one. Now, so if I go back, the best you can reach, no matter which system you have, is n to the minus one. And no matter which system you have, I mean, you need to exclude some degenerate cases. This is what this polynomial depth search is about. So now, I mean, you might be familiar with wavelets, which is a system, I mean, widely used in, in diverse applications. Uh, you see the definition here. You have a generating function, which you move around, say the plane, and then you have this means to scale. It's a multi-scale system. Um, this is widely used, but one can show that the rate of approximation is only n to the minus one half, which is certainly much worse than n to the minus one. And the reason is that the system has, um, now you see it's, it, has, it has a specific direction. These are isotropic elements in contrast to anisotropic elements, which would approximate anisotropic structures, curvilinear structures much better. And so there were several approaches to introduce systems of that type. I mean, the first who reached an optimal approximation rate were perflets, but they had the problem that there you didn't have faithful implementations. Now with shields, I mean, this problem is, is solved and um, they are built using a different type of scaling, namely parabolic scaling. You see you scale now in both directions in a different way. So this leads to very anisotropic shaped elements. And then you change the orientation of those by a shearing matrix, which then ensures later on this faithful implementation. And the definition of a shearing system you see here. Again, you see you have a generating function, which you translate, which you also scale, but then you also have the means to change the orientation. Uh, and so if you're a bit familiar with this, I mean, interesting, it's always to see how it tiles the Fourier domain. And so you see here, you get a very directional tiling by these different elements. Now this system solves to some extent the problem. You get indeed this magical rate n to the minus one up to a log factor. If you view this as negligible, you can say, a uh, shielded system reaches this optimal approximation rate. And just as a side remark, I mean, uh, there is also an extensive software library uh, with different uh, programming languages if, and, and lots of demos how to use this system if you're interested to uh, test that out. Okay, so let's go back to the slide, which we already saw. Uh, so you can take curve cartoon like functions, you can take shields here, and then you get this optimal rate n to the minus one up to a log factor. Okay, so now we want to see how deep learning and deep neural networks are doing on that. For that, so this we already saw, this is just the definition again of a neural network. Um, what we need now is a complexity measure. Now, remember before we took the complexity in terms of sparsity. Now we need a complexity measure for a neural network. And what we do there is we go, let's say the memory pass. So we aim for, so low complexity means uh, we have a me memory efficient neural network. So what we do for the complexity measure is we count the number of non-zero elements in the weight matrices and the bias vectors. Uh, so this is the number of non-zero parameters. That's our complexity measure. It's one. I mean, there are others, but this is a very canonical one. And then we will also write that a neural network is in an N neural network with that many layers, this complexity class, this input dimension, and this activation function. 
And so the challenge now is to set approximation accuracy in relation to the complexity of the approximating network in terms of memory efficiency. And there are already several results in this regime. A very classical result is the universal approximation theorem, where you have a continuous function on a compact domain. And the results then says that for every accuracy, you can find a neural network, which has this shape. So it has just one hidden layer, which approximates this F with this accuracy. Now, so in a nutshell, you can say, with shallow neural networks, uh, just very few layers, you can approximate every continuous function on a compact domain with arbitrary accuracy. Now, so that seems an amazing result. Um, still, one problem here from our perspective is that the complexity could be arbitrarily large. No, because here, I mean, you don't have any control over n. Then there are other results. I mean, for instance, Jarotsky has beautiful results in this direction. Um, so here he takes s times continuously differentiable functions um, and then shows here you see now rho is the ReLU activation function that he can approximate f with neural networks. And you see the complexity appearing here. So indeed, here you can set into relation the approximation accuracy with the complexity. However, this is not an optimality result. Yeah? It's not an optimal um, bound. For getting an optimality result, what we need is a lower bound on the complexity. And one way to do that is by, I mean, first introducing a measure for the complexity of a function class. So this optimal exponent, if you're familiar with Kolmogorov entropy, just think of that. Um, and then what you could do is you could show that for a certain type of training and learning algorithms, the number of uh, the, the complexity is always lower bounded. Yeah, so let, let me walk you through this result, um, which says that I have my favorite class of functions and I have an abstract learning procedure, meaning I take an accuracy, I take an element of my function class and I output a neural network which approximates this function with this accuracy. Uh, so this is basically roughly what the training procedure does. And then for every gamma less than this complexity measure, this product converges to infinity. What does it mean? Well, epsilon to gamma converges to zero. So the complexity has to con converge to infinity faster than epsilon to gamma converges to zero. So this gives me a lower bound on the complexity of those neural networks which are learned here, uh, independent on the learning algorithm. Uh, so I have a lower bound for the complexity. And so now I can ask, can I reach this lower bound? Because then I also have an, a memory optimal neural network. And so the key point here is what happens now if you have equality here, that's the first, first situation, you can actually reach this lower bound. And in fact, I mean, this lower bound is also sharp. So how can you do that? I mean, I don't want to go too much into the details. The key idea is that if you have a special function class and you have a compensation system, which gives you an optimal approximation rate, for instance, cartoon-like functions and shear lips. And then what you do is you now mimic what approximation theory does. You build a network which mimics an n-term approximation. Yeah? So think, for instance, my shields are uh, mimicked by those networks. Yeah? Shields is a function and a network is a function. So think of these are all shields. Then an n-term approximation would look like this. Yeah? So you have here all the shields. And then you build the sum over those, the weighted sum. And these are these connections. Uh, and then these networks are the ones which actually do the trick. So these networks perform as well as shielded concerning approximation and are also memory optimal. Uh, so, I mean, this is then a result you can obtain um, for every cartoon-like function. I find a neural network with this complexity 
So it approximates my f with this rate, and here you have this also this rate n to the minus one. So this is the optimal rate. Uh, so the first bound is sharp, and what you also showed this that deep neural networks achieve optimal approximation properties of all affine systems combined. So basically, here you can play this game not only for shearlets, but for wavelets and for a lot of other systems. So concerning expressivity capacity, neural networks are in that sense amazing. I mean, they are in that sense universal that they do as well as all those techniques which we had before. And what is what is even more interesting is that if you now just take this architecture from the proof and you train it, and then you look at what it learned in these compartments, because these are the compartments where before we placed wavelets or shearlets artificially in. Then what you see is if you train it to learn this function from R2 to R, then in these compartments, you, it learns functions of this type, which are about richlets. And if you train it to learn a function of this type, another classification function in these subcompartments, it learns to it learns functions of this type, which look somehow like shields. So in that sense, I mean, neural networks even have the ability to, to some extent, learn systems which we before developed theoretically, like like wavelets and shields. So in that sense. Neural networks are as good as those systems. And you can now ask the questions, are they maybe even better? And for that, I would like to take you now into the world of deep learning for mathematics and uh, specifically inverse problems. Because there, I can also show you some pictures and show you that neural networks indeed perform much better. So an inverse problem, I mean, is um, in some sense, uh, just uh, um, an operator equation to solve. You have an operator, let's say, from a Hilbert space X to another Hilbert space. Um, and what you have at hand is you have the operator, you have G, and you would like to compute F. Right? So you have to solve this uh, system of equations in a sense if it's finite dimension. And a very classical method to do that is what's called sparse regularization. It's this optimization problem where you see here, you aim to solve the inverse problem as accurately as possible. Now, so if you minimize this, ideally you get zero here. And then you have another term where you can incorporate properties of the solution. So here one typically chooses a representation system um, and it's like for instance, shearlets and assumes that for the, that F which we seek, this is sparse, and so the L1 norm would then be small. So that's basically what the sparse regularization is. And so that's a very classical approach um, to solve inverse problems, like, for instance, this in painting problem, where you are missing certain parts of the image which you would like to recover. Now, how to combine this with deep learning? I mean, there are various approaches certainly already out there. For instance, you can take the algorithm to solve this minimization problem and put neural networks at particular parts because some parts are like a denoiser. So you can just replace this with a neural network, which then already improves um, the performance. But I, what I would like to show you here is how to, let's say, a bit better combine or one approach to better combine deep learning with classical methods uh, following the philosophy to use classical methods as far as they are reliable and then complement it with deep learning. And the application I would like to show you is uh, computer tomography. So a CT scanner samples the radon transform, which is you have your um, function here, like the human body, you compute line integrals through it, and then this gives you one slice of the sinogram, and then you rotate. Now, some of you might have already experienced lying in a CT scanner. Ah, and while, while you rotate, you fill the sinogram, and then from this, you would like to recover the interior of the body. It becomes very hard if you don't have access to the full rotation, which is, for instance, the problem in electron tomography. The problem this causes is that you only have a chunk of the measurements and another chunk is missing. And you can imagine if such a huge chunk is missing, 
that creates a serious problem. And you can see that visually. This is my original image. And now I do this procedure where a 60 degree missing angle is missing here. Uh, the easiest reconstruction looks horrible because you have much too few data to recover from here in the cyanogram. And if you do it a bit smarter with this sparse regularization with shields, you still see there's a lot of blurry parts. So how can you now improve this with deep learning? The key is the following. Um, if you recover from um, an angle just of minus 15 to 15 degrees, you, you don't see anything. But then if you increase your angle and the measurements you have at hand, you get a better and better reconstruction. But what you see here is that at a very early stage, you already know certain curves and certain directions even of this curve. Uh, so at a very early stage, I mean, some parts of these edges and the direction of those are already visible and some are not. Yeah, this certainly depends on which direction your line integrals are computed. Yeah? So if you compute them in this direction, then certainly, I mean, you will observe very clearly this part here and its direction as a singularity. But these will be smeared out. This can be made very precise. I mean, there was an old result by Quinto. And you can phrase this in terms of a wavefront set. So wavefront set are singularities together with their direction. Uh, so a wavefront set here would be for each point, each singularity point, you get the direction in which the singularity basically propagates like a wave. And so this is typically depicted in a phase diagram where for each point on the singularity curve, you have here the, the angle associated with it. Now, the problem you face in this case is you have a missing part here in this wavefront set, which you want to form. Yeah, so that, that way you can make it precise. And one knows that shields can identify the wavefront set and can also separate the visible from the invisible part. So an algorithm which you could um, pursue is the following. You first solve the sparse regularization problem with shields. You get then this blurry part here and here. Then you compute another shielded transform. And certain of those coefficients are already reliable and perfect. This you don't touch. These are done by the model-based approach, these you keep. But others are close to zero. And only those you now learn. You learn from these visible ones to compute the invisible ones. Ah, and the key point is that you don't touch those. Now, once you have this good approximation of the invisible ones, you complement it with the visible ones and bring it back to the image domain. Yeah, so driving the model-based approach as right it goes and only learning the invisible part. Ah, and so then you get pictures like this, the top row we already saw. Um, and now you see here an approach using just a neural network without the model part. And you see it already performs better. But the best is if you combine both worlds, um, the model world together with the deep learning world. And this philosophy um, you can also use for different settings. Here you see deep learning can outperform, I think, classical methods by far, as we see here. You can apply this philosophy also to different settings where, for instance, here you have an image and you would like to detect the edge structures and classical methods and even human annotation are more or less crude. But again, combining both worlds, you see in a very clear fashion, you can detect all edges and the color coding indicates even the direction of those. Yeah, so this shows that neural networks indeed can perform much better in this case than classical approaches. And let me now finally, uh, maybe in the last two, three minutes, give you also a glimpse into why partial differential equations uh, might be a good idea to consider uh, neural networks as a possibility for solving those. Now, 
how do people do that? Um, you have your partial differential equations. And what you now do is, again, you use a neural network as an approximator. You approximate the solution by a neural network. And so this is what you aim to compute. And so this requires certainly to put the neural network in the loss function and so on. What I would like to show you here is um, a bit more, maybe more general. Um, I would like to show you here what one can do in the more general setting of parametric PDEs. What is the parametric PDE? Well, I mean, it's a partial differential equations governed by an additional parameter. Uh, so you have here again your PDE, but you have an additional parameter Y. So the task now is given a parameter, compute the solution. Uh, and so the Y could be a, a design parameter, maybe also related to heat or some, some components um, if you're facing a design problem, let's say. Uh, and so you need to solve this many times. Each time you might want to change your parameters and each time you need to compute the PDE anew. Uh, and so if you are in the high dimensional regime, that could cause a computational problem. So to apply neural networks to it, you bring it into the finite domain um, by a high fidelity discretization Then you have here the classical variational form. And now you can ask the question, can a neural network approximate this parametric map? Why is this interesting? Well, I mean, it would be a very flexible approach. And also once you have the neural network, you can compute this in an extremely fast manner. And so questions you can then ask is, there, does there exist at all a neural network which does this and approximates this map? And then how does the complexity depend on key parameters? Like here, the parameter um, P, the dimension of your parameter space, and capital D, the dimension of your discretization. And then also, how does it perform numerically? And indeed, I mean, you, you can show this, you can explicitly construct a neural network. You see that's again an expressivity question. You can construct a neural network which approximates this parametric map and so that you can control the complexity of the neural network depending on these parameters. And this is polynomially controlled. So you don't suffer from the cross of dimensionality and then you can also check that numerically by extensive numerical experiments. And again, I mean, also there you can see that a neural network doesn't suffer from it. So let me finish with some, some final thoughts. Um, I mean, from my perspective, neural networks shows impressive performance, uh, but I think it's a very exciting area for mathematics because the theoretical foundation is largely missing. From my perspective, there are two main directions, mathematics for deep learning and deep learning for mathematics, which needs to be pursued. And in those, I mean, one can identify certain questions. And so this is taken from a survey paper, which we wrote. Um, these to our extent are key questions to ask about the role of depth. This is an expressivity question, what network architecture to choose. The learning question, what about stochastic gradient descent? Then questions from generalization, questions from the numerical side, um, like from inverse problems and from partial differential equations. So from my perspective, as I said, I think there are really exciting future perspectives for mathematics in this area. And this area also needs mathematics um, to a large extent, as I hopefully showed you. And with this, I'd like to conclude and Thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks. Thank you very much uh, to Professor Gita Kudinov for this uh, outstanding talk, very uh, wide ranging talk and very clear. That was really, really appreciated. So um, feel free to unmute yourself if you have any question uh, for Professor Kudinov, or you could also type um, any question you might have in the chat. I have a small question on the PDEs, in fact. Uh, when you have the parametric PDE neural network, uh, do, uh, do you construct a neural network for each PDE or for a certain number of type of PDEs, of class of PDEs? 
So let's 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 yes, see here. Yes, um, approach here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I mean, this is certainly adapted to to the PDE in that sense that um, so so this is just a very crude yes. theory, as you can imagine. There are a lot of hypotheses which you which you require. So in that sense, I mean, um, you, you have many hypotheses on the PDE. So for instance, that the forward operator needs to be um, approximated by a neural network, but then once those are satisfied, um, then you can construct an explicit neural network which approximates that, uh, that type of release. That can support, for example, uh, another PDE, which is very close to the first one, if it's, if it's not exactly the same parametric one. For example, elliptic PDEs. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you have something which would work for a certain class of elliptic PDEs with a given uh, 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 diffusion coefficient or things like that? Yeah, I mean, so, so this result is only for elliptic PDEs, I should say. Ah, okay. Um, and the second uh, question which is induced by that, if you happen to have a PDE which is close to your PDE where you have an explicit solution with a parameter, will that help to train the neural network? So, I mean... Um, if you have a formula for a yeah, close I mean, for, one. Yeah, I mean, for, for the training, certainly you need, I mean, here a lot of, a lot of samples. So this corresponds in a sense to the reduced basis method where also you have first, um, certain solutions you need to compute. Um, and then from that, basically you compute the other. So this, in some sense, the stage is to, to that extent similar. Now, now you're asking if you have one PDE, which is close. I mean, certainly ideally you would like to have these training samples yes. on the PDE you, you want to solve. Um, so concerning stability issues, um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I would guess, yes, it would work, but I mean, I, I, I cannot say for sure. Thank you. Okay, um, I had a, a question. I was really much intrigued by your example where you could learn like ridgelets and shearlets from like the either a, a linearly separated uh, region or a parabolically, yes, this one. So I was wondering like if this, so maybe if you had a, a bit more details on how you were training the the networks in this case to get back these basis function and how sensitive is, is this outcome to the particular training let's say if i use adam or sgd i'm gonna converge mm -hmm. to different basis functions yeah yeah that's also a very good question i mean this is indeed i mean sensitive so i mean sometimes uh, the network develops structures like this but it could also happen that it does not in this case, like do you, do you know here which um, training algorithms were used in this particular cases? Oh, that was was was, was some time ago. I mean, yeah, um, yeah, okay, no worries. Yeah, so, so that I, 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 I think it was stochastic gradient descent, okay. uh, certainly, but um, I mean, yeah, but, but that's all I can say. Yeah, okay, thank you. So, the yeah, but, but uh, as I said, I mean, it, it's sensitive. I mean, it could be that for, for other starting values, you get something which, which has not nice shapes like this. No, but this, I think this, uh, the fact you can get back the, mm -hmm. <laughs> the initial scheme, it's really interesting. And yeah. Okay, let's see if, if anyone else has questions on the chat. Uh, I have a question I'd like to yeah. ask. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I, I'm curious about what you were, saying with a uh, sort of we're lacking a, a, a mathematical, I guess, foundation for, for deep learning theory. Uh, and I was just curious if you could just quickly say um, what, in, in your opinion, I guess the major theoretical like challenges are, like exactly why it's so hard to get, um, for example, like convergence results or, or, or things like that for, for these algorithms and why exactly it's so difficult to, to create a, a, a theory. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question. So let me go back to, I think, the slide, which fully explains this a little bit. Um, so, so I think the, the, as one says, the holy grail is understanding this generalization uh, phenomenon. 
And you see, I mean, people have worked for, for tens of years to get, let's say, theoretical understanding of, of this part. So this is classical statistical learning theory. Like we see dimension and all these ingredients. Um, and so now, I mean, you have this very strange new phenomenon that actually this does not continue here, but in fact, it goes down at some point. And all these classical approaches like the C dimension and so on fail to explain that. So you, you need to develop, I mean, really completely new theories. There's something now people call a neural tension kernel, which has some hope of explaining this um, completely, but it's also this is not, not clear. I mean, this is so this is, I think, one main one main problem. The other main problem is. Uh, which which I which I detailed here a little bit. I mean, the stochastic gradient descent, the stochasticity in it, makes it very hard to analyze. Uh, and uh, it, it's not even clear if you have your energy landscape here, which of these local minima it's is the best in a certain sense. Now, from which which of those generalize the best? Uh, and so this creates a situation which. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult to analyze. I mean, people sometimes now look at networks with, with one layer where only certain components are learned and can then analyze stochastic gradient descent. But I mean, the complete picture is right now still, um, yeah, I wouldn't say out of reach, but I mean, it's, you, you, you don't have a complete picture. So these are two of the main, main problems one in one faces. Thank you. All right, so maybe one last question if the audience uh, wants. Actually, yeah. since we're in this, on, on, this, yes. uh, on this image, yeah, I, I, I asked this, you know, more or less this question. So do, do, you, do you think that this double, you know, descent phenomenon is an artifact of the algorithm that we use to train? Yeah, I mean, to, to my knowledge, this also happens, I mean, using other algorithms. Um, I mean, what, what, what seems to happen is some inner regularization uh, in the network. And so this is something, a direction people, people go to and aim to analyze why you have this inner regularization. So in that sense, I mean, to some extent, certainly it depends on the algorithm, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it could be that there are other the elements that don't show that phenomena, but I mean, with stochastic gradient descent, you usually observe it, and certainly, I mean, it, it's also, I mean, quite beneficial that we have this phenomena, because otherwise, I mean, neural networks would, would not work. And, and so the left picture here, it, it's agnostic to the, uh, somehow, the, it, it's a theoretical result, right? But it's, uh... That can be theoretically explained, yeah. All right, so uh, let's thank the speaker again. And <laughs> I would, yeah, perhaps stop the recording. Now we are, yeah, past one hour. So yeah, thank you very much.